Space, the final frontier. For millennia, we have gazed upon the stars, thinking what could be out there and if we could ever reach them. The universe is immense. We don't know exactly how big the entire universe is, but we have calculated that what we can observe is over 92 billion light years across. This means that light, the fastest thing that can travel through space, takes 92 billion years to go from one side to the other. Except it won't because the universe is expanding in the meantime, so it would take an infinite amount of time to reach the opposite side. So with this immensity, how could we ever hope to colonize, take over the entire universe? It seems completely ludicrous, impossible. Or is it? My name is Fede, and this is Eternally Curious. Space has inspired and kindled the human imagination for generations. The first serious study of human colonization of other planets was done in 1952 by German physicist Werner von Braun. And since then, we have planned dozens of missions to Mars and other planets, but so far, not a single one has come to fruition. Recently, NASA has laid out a plan for 2035, and SpaceX has an even more audacious plan, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Space is hard. There are a million things that could go wrong at any time, and when they do, you have no one to ask for help. You are completely and utterly alone. So if we can't even make a quick stop to a nearby planet, how could we ever hope to colonize our solar system or the galaxy, let alone the entire visible, observable universe? It's just impossible. Well, it may sound completely crazy, but there is actually a plan without breaking the laws of physics and using only known technologies. This is called exploratory engineering. It's a field of study that looks at what's possible based on the current knowledge that we have, without falling into science fiction or just plain making things up. Now, in order to make a plan work, we need a couple of assumptions. First, if nature can do it, so can we. And if we can do it, we can automate it. Let's start with the obvious. When it comes to space travel, humans are too unreliable. They need food, clothing, uh, sleeping, they get jealous, they get mad, they get cancer when exposed to radiation from interstellar space. They don't last very long in space. The idea is to build the smallest autonomous unit that can travel through space, land on a target and do whatever is needed. This is called a von Neumann probe after the great Hungarian polymath John von Neumann. Robert Freitas had designs for a fusion-powered self-replicating probe since 1980, building up on NASA's Daedalus project. It would take 500 years to make a copy of itself on the lunar surface and weighed over 500 tons. But we are going to need something a little bit more um, quick and compact. If only there were something that we could take hmm, inspiration from. Take something as simple as an acorn. It only weighs a few grams at most. Essentially, it's a solar-powered machine that builds a giant factory that produces more acorn. It's quite amazing if you think about it. The information and algorithm for the process are stored in DNA, which can last for thousands of years and survive the vacuum of space. And if nature can do it, so can we. If we run the numbers, using conservative estimates, we could realistically build a self-replicating acorn, uh, I mean, uh, probe, capable of doing exactly what we need and weighing about 30 grams. Okay, we have our design for the probe, we can just shoot it into space. Well, not exactly. Our probe can't just barrel through the galaxy, piercing through planets and stars and asteroids. It has to eventually slow down 
decelerate, land on an asteroid or a planet, find resources, and then start the process of self-replication. Slowing down when you're going at 90% the speed of light or more is no small feat. It takes energy, and storing that energy requires mass. Depending on the propulsion technology we decide to use, and how exoteric we want to be, our probe might weigh as much as a small lemur, three African elephants, or a humpback whale. Okay, so we shoot this lemur slash whale into space, and we hope that it doesn't collide with planets, asteroids, or other stuff that's out there. Well, the universe is a very big place, and distances between celestial objects are quite astonishing. When we look at a picture of our solar system, those pictures are all kind of lies for the sake of space in the page. In reality, things are very, very far apart. This website has an interactive representation of how far things really are when scaled proportionally. Okay, so then we are good. There's so much empty space, we don't need to worry about it, right? Not exactly. At these astonishing relativistic speeds, even the slightest collision with a tiny object would be enough to generate an explosion and blow our probe to a million pieces. Sure, in theory we could use a disposable low-mass shield traveling ahead to ionize incoming particles and then use a magnetic field around the probe to deflect them, but we are not going to. The probe needs to be as light as possible and as simple as possible. Since there are no humans on board, it's much more efficient to design a system with redundancy, where we expect probes to explode, and so we just make more. How many more? If we work out the math, we need about 40 probes per galaxy to be almost sure that at least one will survive. Okay, how are we doing on our checklist? Self-replication? Check. Deceleration? Check. Redundancy? Check. Okay, so we're ready to go. We just have to somehow build the probes, send them into space, 40 per galaxy, 400 billion galaxies out there. Easy. We're going to need a lot of energy. And I mean, a lot. Remember, we said we're not gonna use any futuristic magical technology, so we have to rely on what we have and stick to what we know we can build. The best source of energy is staring us in the face. The sun is an amazing thermonuclear reactor producing one million times more energy in a single second than all of humanity's consumption for an entire year. The problem is, of course, that the vast majority of the energy does not reach the surface of the Earth, and uh, transporting and storing all of that energy isn't very practical, unless we did it directly in space. The concept of the Dyson Sphere, a shell of solar panels surrounding an entire star, is a staple of science fiction, but it's not as impossible as it may sound. All we need is a little bit of engineering, self-replication, and the power of the exponential curve. We start with planet Mercury. Mercury is close enough to the Sun to receive a lot of its awesome radiation but not too close to fry all of the equipment immediately. Now, building an entire sphere of solar collectors around the Sun with the circumference of the orbit of Mercury is indeed a little bit too challenging. But since we don't need all of the energy coming from the Sun, we could build something a little bit different. A swarm. A collection of independent solar captors in orbit around the Sun tightly coordinated and arranged in a grid system. Commercial solar panels today have already exceeded 20% efficiency and some even 30 or more. And that, if we work out the numbers, is more than enough. Okay, so we build a Dyson bubble swarm thingy around the sun. Uh, how? Who is the contractor that's going to fly off to Mercury and build trillions of solar collectors and put them into orbit? and? Where are they going to find the materials? How much is it going to take? Millions of years? And how much is it going to cost? Again, the answer is very close to us. Mercury is composed of 30% silicate and 70% metal. The perfect raw materials for building our swarm. 
First, we send autonomous probes to mine the surface of Mercury and begin assembling the first solar collectors for the swarm. The more miners we build, the more collectors we can add to the swarm. As we have more collectors, we can generate more energy, and with more energy, we can build more miners and collectors. It's a feedback loop. And believe it or not, if the process is fully automated, we could disassemble planet Mercury in just 31 years, 85 days. And most of the mass will be lost in just the last four years. That's the power of exponential growth. Okay, well, wait a second. You want to destroy planet Mercury? Are you crazy? Won't this like, destabilize the entire solar system and the gravitational balance between the planets, uh, ushering a catastrophe of cosmic proportions here on Earth? Well, I never said it was a good idea or that we should do it. I'm just looking at what's possible given the technology we have. And while we may have to rewrite some books and edit a few Wikipedia pages, it won't change the fate of the Earth. Mercury's mass is 10 million times smaller than that of the Sun. We would barely notice. But it will change the fate of humanity and our place in the universe. If the goal is seeding the universe, we need to expand in every possible direction. This is the classical strategy. First, we visit a few galaxies, then we refuel, make more spaceships, jump to the next galaxy, and so on. Each time we land on a planet, we have to slow down, build another Dyson Swarm, and repeat the process again and again. It's really slow. Here is another option. We start from one galaxy, the one where we live, build enough probes for redundancy, and shoot all of them at once. It doesn't really matter how long will it take for each of the probes to arrive. Once they're gone, they're gone. Some of them will be destroyed, and that's why we have redundancy. But eventually, the ones that survive will reach their destination and fulfill the duty. It's important to note that regardless of the technology, we can't really reach all the galaxies we see. The reason is simple. The universe is expanding at an exponential rate. The further something is from us, the faster the expansion is. Even faster than the speed of light. Since our probes can only go at a fraction of that, some parts of the universe will always be out of reach. Unless we can use wormholes and warp spacetime with negative energy ships, but that's science fiction. Okay, let's review the plan for colonizing the universe, sort of. We build autonomous, self-replicating von Neumann probes and send them towards Mercury. The probes start to mine the surface and make copies of themselves, building solar collectors that will generate the energy to mine more materials and create a Dyson Swarm around the Sun. As the loop feeds on itself, in a little over 31 years we have consumed the entire planet and built trillions of probes. We launch these probes into space, 40 per galaxy. Once a probe reaches its destination, it will decelerate and seed the galaxy by landing on an asteroid or a planet. Then it repeats the same process, thus beginning the colonization of its new galaxy. Now, this is an extremely bold and audacious plan, and there are indeed a lot of things that could go wrong. For example, if the density of interstellar dust is 10 or 100 times greater than what we originally estimated, we would need to build 100, 1000 times more probes, which would require extra steps and extra hops in between the galaxy, thus making it much longer. Still, in cosmic timescales, these are very small numbers. What's 30 or 300 or 300,000 years when the universe is billions of years old? And this raises a very important, somewhat puzzling question. If the colonization of the entire universe is well within the reach of an advanced civilization, such as ours a few decades or centuries into the future, how is it that we haven't seen any signs of these civilizations out there? We haven't seen Dyson swarms or spheres around and we haven't been colonized by other intelligent species. Or have we? Ah!